Hello and uh, welcome to uh, another uh, Catholic Concern for Animals YouTube conversation and I'm delighted to welcome today Dr Lynn Stedden from uh, the Department of Biological and Environmental Sciences at the University of Gothenburg uh, in Sweden and um, uh, Dr Stedden has been uh, uh, a very important researcher in the area of um, pain with respect to, to fish in particular uh, and around a range of other aspects of animal behaviour um, and uh, you actually um, in our fish and marine welfare conference a, a while back uh, Lynn you, you actually kind of uh, uh, threw the question at me of whether I believe fish feel pain or not um, which I was delighted um, to feel. I actually think I said I don't care whether fish food pain, we ought to treat them better anyway. Um, and so I'm going to start by throwing that question back on you. Do you believe fish feel pain? I certainly do. I've worked on this question for the last 22 years and a very, I was the very first person to characterize nociceptors and these are specialized receptors on, on, our, on our skin that detects potentially painful stimuli. So things like high mechanical pressure, cutting, noxious chemicals like acids, venoms, and also uh, high and low temperature. Up until around uh, 2002, we didn't know that fish had these receptors. And, and many of my sort of vegetarian friends would say, oh, it's fine to eat fish because they have no feelings. Um, and so we really didn't know about pain of fish at all until that time. And so I undertook a project with Dr. Mike Gentle at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh, where we um, set out to find out this very thing. Do they have those kinds of receptors? And indeed they do. So I work with rainbow trout and they have the same uh, nervous system, um, the same physiology, um, the same responses in uh, the brain in response to pain. And we also showed that the the fish show strange anomalous changes in behavior when they're in pain. And so they suspend feeding behavior. Um, we injected them subcutaneously under anesthesia with a mild acetic acid, which is, is like vinegar. So if you've ever got vinegar in a, a cut, you know how sore that is. And, and the fish rubbed the lips against the sides of the tank. And it's much like when we stub our toe we instantly grab it and start rubbing it. And that helps to reduce the amount of pain that we're feeling. And so the fish were doing this. And then when we gave them morphine, which is a very strong pain killing drug, um, we didn't see any of these changes of, of behavior. The fish fed normally, they behaved normally. And so we basically took the pain away. Since then, I've been working on a variety of different aspects of pain in fish. And, and one of the key questions I think is understanding how important this experience is to the fish. And you can do that in a number of ways. And the way that I chose to go about it was really um, looking at attention. Um, in, in humans, there is a theory that we have a limited pool or capacity to our attention, and we can't perform competing tasks that well because we only have this limited pool. And pain in us is a very attention dominating state. When you're in pain, you do things less well because you're consumed by the pain. So I thought this was like a very neat way of understanding how important is pain to a fish? Do they do other things as well? Um, you know, so if you give them a competing task or cue, will they actually respond to it? And what I found was that rainbow trout, when they were in pain, did not respond to fear stimuli. So they didn't show a fear response and also didn't respond appropriately to anti-predator cues. Um, uh, predator cues, so they didn't show anti-predator behavior um, and so they didn't hide and they didn't try to escape and of course that would have a, a detrimental effect on them in, in the natural situation if a predator was around and so that shows that pain is the imperative and I do believe very strongly that being in pain is an important state for the, the, uh, the fishes to be in and it does have detrimental effects on their behavior and physiology and, and so I do think pay, pain uh, is experienced by fish and it's something that we should seek to avoid, reduce or minimise when we're using fish. I, I, one of the interesting things I think about this, this debate, and I, I, I 
don't know how prevalent it is in the the, the literature, but um, certainly I've kind of heard it in uh, conversation that people, because I grew up, you know, I mean, I'm of an age where when I was a kid, I, I knew fish didn't feel pain and I knew fish had a three second attention span and, 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 and that was it, you know, um, and um, that was just what you, you grew up believing. Uh, it was the background knowledge. And I think, you know, kind of, work like yours has, has shown that, that that fish do feel pain that it affects their behavior which i think is very important um but now you have people saying well they feel pain but it's not like our pain it, it's not like human pain mm -hmm. i mean how would you respond to that yeah i mean how do you know have you ever been a fish in a previous life um, it becomes a very philosophical question, really, uh, and it's very difficult to get into the minds of other animals and know how they feel. But I, you know, you could be in pain right now. I can't tell. Um, and in humans, we self-report to each other. Mm. We say, I've got a terrible headache. And because you've had a terrible headache, you can empathize. It's very difficult to get into the animal mind because animals can't communicate with us directly. All we can do is make behavioral and physiological measurements in response to a potentially painful event. And if the, the behavior and physiology is adversely affected, then we make a judgment based on that sound scientific evidence that it is very highly likely that the fish is in pain. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, it's, it's not the same as human pain. Like that could be true because uh, like I say, I don't know how the fish exactly feels. All I can tell you is that the brain is active and it differs from non-painful stimulation, that the animals have the neurons to detect the painful stimuli, that they behave um, and, and adversely when they're in pain and that this is an important situation for them. Does it really matter if it's the same as us? Um, you know, it's kind of irrelevant really what we see is something that impairs the welfare. And in my opinion, you know, we should do something about that. We should try and prevent it. Yeah, I, 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 well, I think that's a, a, a good argument. I mean, um, one of the things that, that um, uh, we've talked about in, uh, in our debates on, on fish is um, uh, the whole um, way in which uh, we react to fish. I mean, you talked about um, communication and um, it, it's much easier to understand other mammals, to understand mm. dogs and cats, to understand even, you know, seals and fish just are really different creatures to us, really alien creatures in many ways. And um, it, it must be difficult to kind of like assess and interpret their behaviour because of, of that lack of ability to understand the way they communicate. Very much so. And I think in, unless you spend a lot of time with fish, I think they do seem as something quite different. They obviously live underwater. So we, we don't regularly see them in our lives, whereas we do with cats and dogs and, and, and other pets and the mammalian pets like gerbils. So we know when there's something wrong with our dogs or our beloved cats. We know when they're behaving abnormally. And, and we, we, we see that because we know very, very intimately what their normal behavior looks like. And so we know when it changes. And that's one of the key things that I've talked about quite a bit is really, unless you've spent a lot of time with fish, it's quite difficult to interpret any changes in behavior. Um, and fish are under the water, so they're kind of hidden from us. You know, if you went to a, a dairy farm, you'd see the cows in the fields and you'd see them. Whereas if you go to a fish farm, um, a salmon cage, you're going out to a fjord or the middle of an estuary and then there's this cage. And e even then you can't see the fish because you have to go underwater. And so I think we, we sort of lack knowledge and experience with fish that does affect the way we view them. And that really to properly sort of empathize with them, you really need to spend a lot of time with them. So I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours watching them. And I can tell, you know, very quickly which fish is dominant in a tank, which fish is, um, you know, stressed or which fish is in pain, because I've spent hundreds of hours doing this. Um, and I often talk with people in public aquariums and they can tell, you know, there's a problem with their animals, their fish in the aquariums. Um, because they've spent a lot of time looking after them. 
And fish are also the third most popular pet now. So something like one in 10 households in the UK have pet fish either in their tanks or in their ponds outside. And, and the people who look after them, they become a very beloved pet. And, and they watch their behavior. They're very responsive to humans. Fish learn very quickly. And, and so they have an interaction with them. And so they also can interpret behavioral changes and have more of a, a sympathy or empathy with fish. Um, and, and so I think it, it really depends on how you see fish, how you view them. And I think we have a very complicated relationship with fish because some people eat them. So they see them as a foodstuff. People farm them, so they see them as a production animal. People catch them either in large scale fisheries, so they make a lot of money out of that, or they um, catch them as a hobby, um, angling or recreational fishing. Um, and so they see them as a pastime almost. And then, you know, people pay a lot of money to get into public aquariums to look at their beauty. Um, and then people keep them um, and, and enjoy them as a companion animal. And I think that gives us a very complicated relationship with fish and, and depends how, and how you view them and how much time you spent with them. And, and, and all of that, you know, feeds into how much you value them. I think we do spend a lot more time with mammals than we, we would with fish and of course we you know you get a puppy you kind of know what it needs it needs warmth it needs a nice soft bed it needs food and water you get a fish it lives underwater do you know anything about ph ammonia nitrate all these biological filtration systems you know it's just not as easy you know it's not intuitive really so yeah yeah i, 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 I think it's interesting because you mentioned about um fish being kept in domestic aquariums i think i read so i can't remember who, who said this but that um there are more fish in people's houses in the united states than there are people and um you know i mean that is just a, a, an incredible change um uh, from when i was uh young and um you know when you maybe had a goldfish in somebody's house and that was it mm. um i mean that familiarity hopefully will, will, will create a new relationship um, of people with fish but I, I think one of the things that that you know kind of um we tend to forget is that we tend to lump fish in fish uh, uh, as a single creature and they they're not there's an in incredible diversity um in uh um the 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 fish as a species in fact um some people argue they shouldn't be just regarded as one species and um you know to to what extent can we um generalize across the whole fish population and you know should we actually be um doing more research about the behavior of different types of, of fish yeah very much so so you are right you'd say you talk about fish as a, a sort of thing one thing but there's actually something like thirty-five thousand different species now we'd never refer to a dog a cat or a mouse is a mammal. We'll call us all mammals. We would would call them by their sort of common name. So people tend to think about fish as just one entity, which is quite strange when you have so many, so much, so much diversity. As you said, you know, you've got rainbow trout, Atlantic salmon, you've got um, tilapia, um, you've got, of course, the shark skates and rays. You've got. Um, rabbit fishes, coral reef fish, and all of these species are just wonderful and they're so diverse in terms of their environmental requirements, the temperatures that they live in, their behaviours, their life histories, everything is so very, very different. And certainly the studies that I've conducted on uh, pain in fish, we've shown species specific differences in behavioural responses. So for example, rainbow trout will become much less active sink to the bottom and not do very much when they're in pain. Zebrafish, which is a small tropical species, completely different in terms of its environmental requirements, will do the same. However, if you cause pain to Nile tilapia, um, they become more active and swim more. And, and so really, I think we need to look at the species on a case by case basis and, and assess their behavioral changes really you know, in each species, because what one does, another one doesn't. And then we see this in mammals. So mm. dogs behave very differently to cats that behave very differently to rats that behave differently to rabbits. Um, and you even get differences between different breeds of dogs in terms of their pain related behavior. 
and and so you know even within humans people have different pain thresholds people will respond differently to pain some people can work through it and some people are consumed by it and so yeah there is a great diversity of fishes that out there that we really will need to look at each species on, on its in its own right mm -hmm. I, I had a look at your profile at the university um uh, uh the other day and um I, I i come from a social sciences background so you know we tend to you know just be published stuff under our individual name this this you know and we tend to be rather jealous about you know that although yeah you know, there's encouragement to do less of that but you you serious scientists you know you always have about you know kind of like half a dozen or more people on each paper now i had a look at your publications and one of the things which struck me is that you're down with you know loads of other people's on on lots of your papers then you come to the pain stuff and it's just you is is that a reflection of research in 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 the area is that is that something which tends to be the case that that people who actually are researching things like pain tend to be doing it on their own rather than as a, as a group yeah um much of the ones that I've published on my own have been um from there in the early days when i was a postdoctoral scientist at roslyn uh, i published the sort of anatomy and electrophysiology of, of the pain uh, neurons in rainbow trout on my own and that was really thanks to my boss mike gentle who was a wonderful man and he thought it was better for my career to have single author papers because they are rare in science and so I was very lucky to have a great mentor there who was like, oh, I'm going to retire soon, so I don't care. You go first, you go single author because it'll be really good for your career. And it did really help. And later years, I write a lot of um, reviews and, and sort of analysis of, of the main topics of animal pain. Um, and, and working on the definitions of animal pain and, 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 and reviewing all aquatic animals, not just fishes. And so, yeah, I, I've written those mainly on my own um, because um, well I'm the one working in the area and so yeah. uh, I'm the one doing the work and so I guess I'm the best placed person to write these and many of these are written under invitation so you know they come to me and ask me. Um, in terms of the, the empirical work though um, that does involve groups of people so my most recent work which was developing an intelligent monitoring software for measuring the welfare of laboratory zebrafish um, accurately and using artificial intelligence to gauge the welfare and the behaviours of zebrafish, see whether they're behaving normally or abnormally. Um, mm. That involved collaboration with engineers. Um, and so they wrote the software and also, you know, um, students and postdoctoral staff who, who conducted most of the work and we did the analysis together and wrote the papers together. So when you're, you're doing uh, laboratory science, you tend to work in a group, um, but much of the reviews I've written, I've written as a sole author, um, mm. just because, you know, I know the work so well. Um, and I guess I, I love writing as well, as well. so um, it fulfills that uh, behavioral need for me. So, mm. yeah. There's been a big increase, it seems to me. I mean, I, I, I may be wrong about this, but it seems to me there's been a big in increase in interest in researching uh, marine um, in environments over the past few decades. Mm. And of course, the big changes uh, that have happened have been the, the, the rise of um, uh, industrialised trawling mm. and the rise of aquaculture. Um, and to what extent have those two factors driven research in in the academic world yeah these are incredibly hot topics and i think in terms of fisheries um researchers are looking at the sustainability question and and because of the advent of the super trawler which can catch enormous numbers of fish and take them from the sea um there is a concern there that they are going to you know overfish and effectively drive populations into extinction and so from from a fishery science point of view it's very important that we understand the the um you know how big are these populations what is their reproductive behavior so should we be catching fish at a certain age or are we taking all the breeding fish out of the population such that the population will collapse because they can't breed the next generation 
you know, where are those nursery grounds for young fish? We shouldn't be catching fish or damaging the environment there. So all these sort of questions about sustainability of fishing uh, and the populations that are there and trying to manage them effectively is very, very important. And this is these have become crucial questions in, in fishery science. In terms of aquaculture, that's again become much more prevalent. It's grown exponentially over the last sort of, 20 years. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because our populations, our human populations are growing to such an extent and they need protein. And, and a sort of, it's sort of be a sort of cheaper way of producing a large amount of protein is fish farming. And so we can produce very high numbers of fish in a very small, a relatively small space compared with terrestrial mammalian farming species and also birds. Um, and so this is this has just grown massively over the last few years. Again, we need to understand what is the optimal way to keep these animals, get how to breed them, what is their life histories, and what species are actually good for farming, because that's a key question. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, sort of research is centered upon um, disease control. What are the impacts on the environment? What happens to escapee farm fish? Will they affect normal fish populations? And, you know, sort of optimizing their health and welfare so that, you know, we do have healthy food for people to eat because we don't want to eat animals that have been sick or stressed. And so, yeah, I think the sort of, uh, the use of fish is, is, is increased dramatically and alongside that, so is the science. In popular culture, we've had the release here in the past few weeks of this film Sea Spiracy um, from the people who made Cowspiracy before. Um, I haven't had a chance to, 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 to see it yet, but I, mean, I wonder how that kind of affects, um, you know, the, the kind of science community, how they feel about these kind of like popular culture um, uh, explorations of, of, of these issues? Yeah, it's been a bit of a bomb going off, I think, amongst um, the community in terms of the science. Um, I have watched it um, and there's been a lot of criticism um, from fisheries industry, from um, the, the sort of charities that work in, in terms of sustainable fishing and from scientists. Um, there's been a lot of positive responses, of course, from people who've watched it. I personally think it's a personal journey for the filmmaker, so they insert themselves into the, the centre of, into the heart of the documentary, which really he, his take on it, Ali Tabrizi, is that he um, doesn't know much about fishing, but loves the marine world, and then sets out to find out what's going on. Now, the issues that he highlights are not new. Um, we've known about them for a very long time, but it is, it, it, he does cherry pick and of course it's very sensationalist. Um, and, you know, he, he doesn't talk too much about farming, but it's mainly about the, the lack of sustainability of, of fishing, the impact on the environment, you know, what we're actually doing to animals, bycatch, discards, um, and these sort of very important issues. I think at the end of, of, of the documentary, he makes the decision to go vegan, which is his choice. But I think then, you know, the, there is a bias running through this very personal documentary in terms of showing the worst of the worst and not covering any fisheries that are being managed very well. So there is an issue there. The, obviously, the filmmaker has an agenda to sell. The good thing I take from it is that these issues are happening, that we need to know about them, and it's getting the general public thinking about it, talking about it, discussing it, and it's bringing it to the forefront of their minds. And I think if anything good can come from this, people will care more about the marine environment, they will care more about fishes, and, and, and that's really the, the optimal thing that can come from sea spiracy. I, I think that I mean I, I would I would agree with that I, mean, I think that for me that the 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 importance of of cow spiracy and sea spiracy is, is actually kind of like um, raising debate because mm. I think what one of the things which I think is important is that people who do eat meat eat fish um, are aware of the issues with the production with the way in which that meat fish meat or um, 
uh, animal meat gets onto their plate. And um, uh, I think it is important to, to, to raise this debate, though, I, you know, I take your point. But I mean, with more debate, I mean, surely we will, that we will move away from the sensationalist and move more towards an, actual, an understanding of the real problems and, and the range of issues that face both aquaculture and um, fisheries. And, and actually, I mean, it's not just fisheries, because you've got recreational fishing, you've got all sorts of ways in which we wrest these creatures from their world um, um, uh, uh, without really understanding that world in the first place. Yes, very much so. And I think we can only make progress and inform the public through talking about these things, discussing them. And it's the public that drive changes in welfare because it's the consumer that has the power to say, I'm willing to pay for better welfare or I want this animal to be farmed in this way so that its welfare is improved. And, and we see that has happened very successfully in uh, chickens in terms of egg production. You know, no, we no longer accept that chickens should be kept in these cages and, and, and their welfare was very, very poor. We now want free range eggs and we're willing to pay a higher price for free range eggs um, rather than those coming from um, battery chickens. And we've seen a, a big shift in the egg market to much more welfare friendly production. Um, and we've seen that with um, outdoor pig farming. And it's really the public that need to push the supermarkets and the producers to say, no, I want fish that are caught sustainably, caught in a humane way and treated in a very humane way or farmed with better welfare. And I'm willing to pay more for that. Mm. Um, and that is the public that could drive that improvement in welfare. How how do you think the the kind of debate about marine welfare and and, and fish uh, and other uh, marine creatures as well um, relate to um, the um, the non marine um, uh, uh, world? I mean the, the 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 world which we tend to inhabit because you know I mean one one of the constant things is that we we this is a, an alien environment for us mm. and we don't understand it anything like as well. I mean not that we really understand the the environment that we we live in ourselves um so how how do these two things mesh together do you think yeah i i've always said um that in terms of aquatic animal welfare certainly for fish both freshwater and marine we are kind of 10 years trailing behind what we know about mammal or bird welfare and and, and the production industry and we're making quite a lot of progress, but we're kind of behind. And fish welfare is a relatively new concept. And I think not really until um, the first study I published in 2002, which showed that fish had these nociceptors, these pain receptors. It wasn't really until then that fish welfare really sort of blossomed. And after that, you know, well, if fish can feel pain, what else are they capable of? Capable of? And how, how, do the things that we do to fish, how does that affect them? You know, can we do it better? Can we improve their welfare? Um, and so we are trailing a bit behind, but we're, we're working hard to catch up, I think. And I, things will get better. So in terms of fishing, if you bring uh, fish up from depth too quickly, um, their swim bladders will burst and that will be incredibly painful. However, if you bring them up much, much, more slowly, then they have time to equilibrate, you know, and then that doesn't happen. So there are simple things that we should be doing and could be doing. And so people are starting to look at how can we improve the experience for the fish. So, if, so if, for example, in angling, I wrote a review where we suggested using um, barbless hooks so that you could, there were less damage to the fish and, and you could remove them easier you know, not using knotless nets because that, that causes abrasion to the skin and causes mm -hmm. damage, which could cause pain. And so there's lots of things that are happening now. People are looking at all of the ways that we use fish and then thinking, how can we do this much better? So it's a, a less invasive and we can improve welfare because improving the welfare of fish is, is good for all of us. You know, if, if you want to eat fish, you want healthy fish. You want, if you're growing fish in a fish farm, you want them to be in good welfare and grow really well and, and, and be tasty for your customers. 
you know, if you want sustainable populations and fisheries, you want them to be healthy. You know, you want them to be in good condition so they breed and there's lots of fish in the sea. So for me, fish welfare is a no-brainer and benefits everyone. Chris, is there anything that you want to come in on at this stage? Well, uh, firstly, um, I'd just like to say initially th thanks to Lynn for, for what is an incredibly interesting discussion already um, about the, the issue of, of fish. Uh, and I think she's already highlighted a number of the issues that, that CCA uh, are interested in. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, um, our, our, our name is Catholic Concern for Animals, and that concern also equates to fish as it much as does to anything else. And one of the issues we're all often talking about is there shouldn't be a hierarchy of animals. They mm. should all matter, uh, you know, however big or small they happen to be. Um, and it's very interesting because you, you, you've already touched upon the discussion of, of how many fish species there are, you know, uh, and they're still referred to as fish and they're never referred to as individuals. Uh, and, you know, individuals, they are, they are individuals. We are all individuals, somebody once said, I think. And, and it's true as, as about a fish as it is about a human or any, any other creature. But they're never, they're never looked at or very rarely looked upon uh, as individual creatures. Um, so it, this is a really, really interesting uh, discussion already and, and wide ranging. I mean, we've talked, uh, uh, Gerald, you and Lynn have already talked about like, wild fisheries, aquaculture, research fish, companion animals, recreational fishing, all the all the, the issues that CCA deals with in other animals relate to fish as well. You know, it, 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 they are different. I mean, as he's rightly said, they live in this other world, this alien world, which we can't enter unless we, we, we're wearing some sort of breathing apparatus uh, or, or we, 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 you know, we're some other mechanism um, to, to, view, to view the fish. We can't, we can't enter their world easily. And therefore, that's possibly will explain a lot of the reasons why we don't know until very recently much about them. Um, uh, and uh, we, we, you know, we talked about the fact that um, the fish welfare and fish understanding is growing, but it's from a very low base, very low base mm -hmm. compared to other creatures, because we've spent tens of thousands of years living with those other creatures. So we do know a little bit about them. We might, having said that, we might not cons uh, care for them as much as we should, but we have a more understanding of them, whether it's the companion animal or the farmed animal or, or even the, even wildlife. Um, so this is a very interesting and very topical discussion. I'm really pleased we're having it uh, at this point. And um, that, it, what, one of the things that does, does, does come to me is, is this issue of individuality and that we need to try and somehow get to the general public and anybody actually who is involved, that you know, these creatures are individuals. They're not tonnage or mm. they're not whatever, they, they're not traditionally referred to, you know, um, and that will be a major breakthrough. I'm not sure how easily that would occur, but to actually just think about fish as individuals, like you think of your cat or mm. your Rex or whatever it happens to be, uh, that, you know, um, that we, we start to think about fish individuals. And I think we're a long way from doing that uh, uh, as, as humans. Um, but I think that would be a, an also a very big breakthrough. Yeah, very much so, Chris. Um, it's really inspiring to hear Catholic concern for animals, care for all animals equally. I think it's amazing, really, really admire your stance on, on animal concern and welfare. Um, yeah, fish are individuals. There might be a huge number of them, but yeah, they all have their own characteristics. And, you know, we do talk about fish as if they're a plant in many ways. So when people catch fish, they'll say, we're going to harvest them, like you would harvest wheat. You know, they could get called a crop in fish farming. Well, they're not a crop. You know, they're not rice, they're actually animals. And so, some of the terminology we use around fish does sort of relate them to being a plant, you know, being a kind of inanimate object almost, which is sad. And so, you know, you have to be aware of the terminology. And, and whenever I review manuscripts or grants or anything, I point out, you know, 
you're not harvesting the fish you're killing them slaughtering them you know just like you would do with cows or pigs or sheep it's exactly the same thing so why say i'm harvesting you know um and 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 get people out of this sort of um terminology and 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 try to to get them to think of fish as animals because even that can be you know something people you know say to me how does fish compare to animals you know well well they are an animal actually you know I've done quite a lot of work on intraspecific variation in animal personality so believe it or not fish have personalities and um, rainbow trout are a wonderful model for this And you get very bold trout, which are like extroverts. Um, So, you know, the loud person at the party, um, they are very active. They take lots of risks. Um, They're very uh, explorative. So they move around a lot. Um, When you feed them, they practically jump out the water and bite your fingers to get the food. Um, And they're very dominant and aggressive. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, so the same genetic background, the same family of fish, you will get very shy fish who are like the introvert at the party sitting in the corner, not chatting to anyone. They don't take risks. They're very cautious in nature. They don't move around very much. They're very subordinate. They're not very aggressive. So the bold fish always dominate them. And, and I see these, you know, these characteristics that make the individuals um, identifiable within a group you know so they're not a fish is not a fish they have their own personalities their own individual characteristics that distinguish them from each other and it's, it's really quite a delight you know studying this because we tend to think of personalities being a human trait well actually no the sort of definition of personality is just individual characteristics that can distinguish one from another and fish show these amazing diversity and personalities. Um, it's really um, quite a privilege to work on, on these kinds of topics and show that actually one fish is not a little robot that's identical to the next fish. They are actually very, very different and, and they are able to make behavioral decisions based on you know, external stimuli, you know, what's happened to them in the past and they can learn and remember um, very complicated tasks, navigating mazes, um, you know, performing choice chamber tests. You know, they, they're very clever. And, and um, I worked with a colleague in Germany, Professor Rupert Schmidt at Gießen, and he worked on learning memory goldfish. And he tested a fish three years after it had been trained and it still remembered the task. And so, you know, it had a very long memory. And of, of course, goldfish can live up to 45 years old so it would you know it would pay for them to have a long memory so yeah you know you're really right Chris that a fish is not a fish it's an individual and hopefully the public will will start um, investigating and, and thinking about this more if I could just come back quickly on that what uh, and about the the theme of the individual because I think it's, it's very important to CCA actually as an organization mm-hmm. this theme of, of animals individual One of the most tragic, but for for me at least, um, wonderful creatures, sorry, creatures, wonderful humans in in, in English literature is Jude the Obscure by Hardy. Mm -hmm. And his terrible reaction he had to the the slaughter of a pig in front of him, the individual. You know, one day hopefully we'll get to the case where fish are looked at in the same way that slaughter of one individual fish will cause such Mm -hmm. horror and and we don't want to do it. And... um, but obviously, I think we're quite away from that area. But when we could ever get to the thing that, you know, fish are seen as individuals, each worthy of their own life, yeah. uh, which is anything else, then I think that will be a major, major breakthrough. And um, hopefully all the work you're doing and, and others will, will, will bring that day closer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. They must have a life worth living. That's important. So uh, as an animal welfare scientist, I do, I do believe we have the right to use animals, but we should do it humanely and ethically, and we should keep them in the best possible conditions and, and safeguard their welfare. And they should definitely have a life that is good and worth living. I, can I just raise a couple of points to, to kind of wrap up on? Uh, really? I, I mentioned sea spiracy earlier. I suppose the other big public cultural 
uh, impact in this area has been <coughs> David Attenborough. Yes. And of course, <coughs> the whole plastics pollution thing with um, uh, Blue Planet 2, but, but also he's got a new series which is coming out about the, the impact of man not being around over the last year mm. in uh, environments. And um, it, it struck me that, um, you know, one of the things, I, because of the, the increase in research which is going on, we've, we've discovered, for example, the importance to certain species of, of fish of sound um, as, as a, a, well, as part of their everyday lives, of, of smell uh, and of all sorts of other things. And, you know, we have created enormous pollution in the ocean which must have affected the, the chemical balance of the ocean has affected the sounds um, that, that these fish uh, and other creatures experience um how do you i mean do you think how do you kind of like view the kind of things that david attenborough is, is doing i mean are are they equally kind of like biased and sensationalist to sea spiracy or is there a kind of more scientific um, approach there. Yeah, David Attenborough is doing a fantastic job of, of highlighting how important the uh, aquatic environment is and how clever animals are within that environment and, you know, the amazing things that they can do. And, um, you know, talking to people who watch his documentaries, you know, they're actually re they really transform their opinion about animals and they think it's just wonderful and that, you know, fish and octopus are really clever now, you know, from that Blue Planet 2 exposure. I think they are much more measured in the way that they present their um, material. Certainly it's more scientific and it's more measured and more balanced. And they're in effect just really relating the natural history of these species. Of course, there are many threats in our environment, you know, plastics, discarded fishing gear, um, lot, you know, the input of human pharmaceuticals into the environment that change fish behaviour. So, you know, things like antidepressants. Um, and, and so really, I think we need to think a bit deeper about our impact on the aquatic environment and what we can do to modify that and reduce it because the oceans, you know, the world is an ecosystem and it, we rely on these aquatic water, water bodies. The earth works so well because of them and it's a unique place in our, our galaxy. You know, there are no other plants that we can see that have a similar, um, uh, you know, ecosystem that can sustain life the way that ours do. And we really need to treasure that. We really need to realise we are part of, this bigger picture and that you know if it goes then we go you know I think I think I, I think that's a very important point because I think one of the things we tend to do is we tend to review our ecology as being the land-based ecology mm -hmm. and we tend to ignore the the oceans uh, which actually is most of our planet yeah. and um, you know th there's far more interaction between the marine environment and the land-based environment that we tend to give it credit for and I, I think that, that you know the point you make is absolutely right that we need to regard these things as working together they're not separate they're not divorced from each other they are part of each other mm -hmm. um and the the following on from what chris was saying about fish being individuals um the research into um marine life tends to be driven by um understandably by kind of commercial interest about how we improve the sustainability um the yield the um amount of fish we can fish over a longer period of time do we need to i mean do you feel that we need to actually adopt different views different principles going forward in our relationship to fish and, and marine creatures yeah, I think most of the funding is for aquaculture or fisheries relevant species, and it's very much applied topics that will benefit fisheries and, and uh, aquaculture. And so that's where the focus is. And that I have to be honest with you, um, getting funding is quite difficult, you know. Mm. And so if that's where the money is, that's where many scientists go 
because you know, they want to have grants. That's how we're measured in terms of our success. Yep. We have to bring in grant money. And if that's where all the money is, I think it really requires a shift in the grant funding bodies and, and the government to say, actually, you know, we need to be looking at more environmentally relevant questions, which doesn't directly relate to fisheries and doesn't directly relate to agriculture, but could improve the environment that fish live in. So I do have some colleagues here uh, who study microplastics and, and found microplastics in fish mussel uh, in the gut, et cetera. And of course, who wants to be eating fish that have microplastics in them? Mm. Um, and so we need to understand how to change that going into the system. And we also need a, a kind of to work with social scientists because scientists are really research scientists um, in terms of academia and biology and fisheries and aquaculture and fish biologists are really good at doing the science, but they're not so good at translating it and se selling it to the public mm -hmm. and communicating the science. It's not second nature to them. And we, we actually need to collaborate more outside our own disciplines with social scientists to try and, and, and inform the public, but also to get the public to change their opinions or behavior, you know, and see actually I shouldn't be using all these one use plastic things. I should try and use paper bags, you know, instead of a plastic bag when I get my tomatoes at the supermarket. I should think about recycling more. And, and, and so I think what we need to do is uh, in biology, fisheries, et cetera, is we need to work more on questions that would prevent the problems from happening um, and find solutions to getting rid of human pharmaceuticals from wastewater treatments, you know, so they're not going into the environment. And so we need to look at, take a broader view of the research that we're doing and actually make sure that has impact amongst the public, amongst governments and other regulatory bodies. And, and only really by working with scientists and researchers and philo philosophers, social scientists, can we do that really effectively. I just come quickly in there, Gerald. Yeah, of course you can, Chris. I, I absolutely agree with with that. We we need to have this wide discussion uh, amongst all sexes of society. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've been particularly pleased with in in recent times, uh, and I'm going to obviously uh, beat a drum here, is the, is the case that the Vatican is showing more interest in in in, in the marine environment. Which, you know, and. You know, we, we should never forget that. I think I'm right in saying 72% of the planet is water. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that's nearly three quarters. I mean, you know, yeah. if, my, if my math still works from my school days. Um, and um, I'm really pleased that, uh, really pleased that the, the Vatican is showing this real interest uh, in, in the marine environment, which, which follows on again, you know, plug, plug for, for Pope Francis encyclical Laudato Si uh, on the environment. And the marine environment, is you know is huge and um again i think and i'm not being critical here of other people but i think that the, the, you mentioned the general look and i think you also did lynn that people focus on the land mm. standard because we live on the land yeah and, yeah uh, it's not a surprise we live on the land we don't live in the sea uh so it's not that it's forgotten that three quarters of the planet nearly isn't land it's just not thought about in the first place um, so I think it's a very, very important thing. And things like um, uh, Attenborough's work uh, in Blue Planet 2 and other people's work is, is bringing that in into more and more focus. And again, I, I just I think I mentioned it earlier. I, I'm not sure. I, I saw the first um, episode of the, uh, the edition of, of 12 Months in the Life of Greta. And she actually said she sailed across back from um, the United States to Europe because she wouldn't take a plane. And of mm. course, she, you know, um, her and her colleagues were a little bit, a little bit wary because they were going off into the Atlantic in a catamaran in the middle of a, a hurricane season. <laughs> yeah. That's quite interesting, you know, because yeah. we, you know, we don't experience the ocean really. No. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very interesting, very interesting, but I think very important point. Yeah, it's very much the cliche out of sight, out of mind. And what uh, David Attenborough does is he brings the marine and uh, freshwater environment into your living room. You can, you know, and he's bringing you into contact 
with things you would never see you know even if you went scuba diving you would never see and it's just wonderful because then it raises that environment and the conscious of 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 people you know everyday people who are just you know not thinking about it because they never come into contact they might not even live close to a coastline you know or a water body and so it's something that maybe just doesn't enter in into the thinking but what his documentaries do is show things and creatures doing very intelligent behaviors octopus you know pretending to be crabs um, just all these fantastical things that uh, aquatic animals do that are just absolutely fascinating and then people have a greater appreciation for them and that's really important yeah i i, I think that's absolutely right and, and it is good to see that that we are beginning and it is the beginning it's, i mean we certainly don't have a full understanding but beginning to understand the marine world um uh, and and you know let's hope we get to appreciate it before we've destroyed <laughs> too much yeah. of it um <clears throat> because i think that's that's you know so important so significant um i mean it does i mean what you mentioned about greta thunberg kind of brought back the to mind you know kind of early sailors you know kind of going on ships you know kind of um who were wary not only of the weather but of course you know here be serpents you know and, um the, the actual dangers of the deep and uh, as they perceive them which I, I think is also interesting um but um that's that's been fantastic lynn thank you very much for your time thank you for very much for coming along and talking to us um before we finish is there anything which we haven't touched on that that, that, that you you would like to to talk about or anything that, that you'd like to add to to what's been said yeah um obviously there's more animals in the aquatic environment than fishes and um there's quite a lot of information about pain and uh, cephalopods so octopus cuttlefish squid the nautilus and there's been some great studies published showing clearly that, you know, octopus experiences pain. The other animals that are not protected by legislation are crustaceans, so prawns, lobsters and crabs. Um, and there are studies now showing that there is the possibility of pain in these animals. Uh, but I think even the speciesism, you know, that kind of discrimination against species is even stronger for crustaceans because you know, they've got a hard carapace, you know, they're you know, sort of armoured, you know, and they're quite aggressive. And I'm just wondering, can I ask you, um, have you thought much about whether you think these crustaceans should be protected by legislation? Well, my personal, my experience, the, the thing I remember, my mother was a cook, um, uh, and I remember her cooking a crab, boarding it alive on mm -hmm. the stove. And of course, the the terrible sound made by the air escaping from under its carapace um, was, you know, appalling. It was appalling to 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 experience that. Um, and you know, the thought of that animal actually experiencing the pain as it was boiled to death. I mean, it's, it's not one which I. I find I found very appeasing at the, the appealing at the time, and so you don't um, nowadays. And um, I think I, I'm not. I, I, I mean, legislation is is limited way forward, but I think we certainly need to change people's appreciation of the whole of our environment mm -hmm. and and our relationship to it. And um, uh, you know, Chris mentioned Ladato Sea, and I think that's very important in terms of the approach to the environment in terms of saying that we are part of the environment we are we are not separate from it all of the environment matters to us and we are an important part of it and and to see us as, uh, as anything else is i think ridiculous and we need to get our heads around that and to understand that in terms of our lifestyle and our behavior and the way we we, we deal with all animals or with all creatures yeah chris do you want to say anything yeah, just just to, to to say again that absolutely i mean we we as an organization don't have the hierarchy of animals that all animals are equally important uh, however small or large they happen to be and everything in between which is which is which is why you know I'll directly answer the question we, we, the answer is yes we do care and concern for for all creatures which is why the conference was fish and marine welfare mm -hmm. just yeah, yeah. it was fish and marine welfare so yes, the answer is yes. 
as for legislation, we, I, I think I think I've got a long list of things that I'd like to have legislation passed on. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very very long list. Yeah, fingers and, uh, crossed. <laughs> and and, and, and the, these creatures will be included. Yeah, yeah, we do have en enough evidence for um, decapod crustaceans to be included in the scientific legislation and also in the Animal Welfare Act. So me, uh, me too, I'd really like to see that happen. Lynn, thank you very much. That's, that's been brilliant. Um, thank you for your time and thank you for coming on and discuss with us uh, the, the issue of marine welfare and, and wider issues in, in animal welfare. And um, thank you for watching uh, this uh, YouTube presentation of Catholic Concern for Animals. Uh, and if you want to catch up with some of our other stuff, they're, they're on our channel, including um, uh, some of the Fish and Marine Welfare Conference, which we've been talking about. So please, please catch up with that. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, everyone who has uh, accessed this um, episode of Catholic Concern for Animals YouTube Life. Thank you.